Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. A rare moment of calm in Syria as the truce is partly observed. 14 rights groups join call to release dying Bahraini hunger striker. And two Afghan protesters killed in anti-US rally. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. The Syrian Revolution's General Commission said nine people were killed today in Homs, Aleppo, Hama, Idlib, Deir Zur, Dara, and the countryside of Damascus. This comes as the Syrian regime announced its adherence to the ceasefire since 6 a.m. this morning, Damascus time. However, activists recorded a number of violations of the ceasefire, including the killing of a civilian at a funeral in Aleppo. Syrian state media accused what it referred to as as armed terrorist groups of attempting to foil the ceasefire by attacking a military bus leading to the death of a colonel and wounding 24 officers in addition to an undetermined number of civilians. These images were taken on Thursday, April 12th in the neighborhood of Karabis in Homs, according to the Syrian opposition. At 6 o'clock in the morning, Damascus time, a calm that some Syrian regions have not seen in months dominated the country. However, this calm did not last long. About an hour after the calm, explosions were heard in the Zabadani area in the countryside of Damascus. Today, Zabadani woke up to the shelling by tanks from a portable checkpoint in the city in the direction of Sahala Zabadani area. The shelling took place in the early hours of the ceasefire plan since it took effect at 6 o'clock in the morning. The sound of an explosion followed by gunfire pierced through the silence and the surroundings of Idlib. The quietness in the countryside of Dirazur was replaced by gunfire. This morning, there was gunfire coming from some checkpoints. I am certain that it was coming from the checkpoints and there weren't any clashes. In addition to that, the regime was behind an explosion near Al-Naf Street in Deir Azur. The tanks have not withdrawn from their positions. Syrian forces were supposed to pull its military vehicles out of the cities on Tuesday, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. The shelling of Rastan in Homs province continued until a few hours before the deadline. At least one civilian was killed at a funeral in Aleppo, and others were killed in Idlib and Deir Azur, according to the opposition. Syrian state news agency Sana said that a colonel was killed, and 24 officers and a number of civilians were wounded in an attack with explosive devices in Aleppo. Damascus had warned that its forces would respond to what it referred to as any terrorist attack. Our BBC correspondent in Damascus said there is no indication that the army's vehicles are retreating back to the barracks. The Syrian Defense Ministry issued a statement Wednesday evening saying its forces remain prepared to respond to any aggression. 40% of the situation is in the hands of the Syrian government. We are committed to fulfilling our duties in this 40%. As for the other 60%, it is under the control of members of armed organizations, which attempt to prevent reaching a political solution by violating the truce. The opposition called for demonstrations after the ceasefire took effect in Syria, claiming the purpose of the ceasefire is to allow free protests. Meanwhile, the Free Syrian Army vowed to respect the deadline as long as Damascus does so. We do not expect the ceasefire to last because the other side will not adhere to it. If the other side complies with it, then there will be demonstrations in front of the presidential palace on the day of the ceasefire. But we do not expect the tyrannical government to comply with the ceasefire. In Turkey, where Syrian refugee camps appeared to be calm this morning, the Turkish foreign minister, Ahmet Davutoglu, said his country is closely following the situation and it is too early to assess the implementation of the ceasefire. The upcoming hours and days will be a tough test for both sides. Hayan Yakub, BBC. BBC.
Bahraini regime forces have crushed demonstrations held across various provinces in solidarity with the detained activist Abdul Hade Al Khawaja, who has been on a hunger strike for more than two months. Meanwhile, 14 international organizations called for mounting pressure on Al Manama to release Al Khawaja. The cries of the Bahraini people are echoing day and night across the country. They are demanding the downfall of the regime, which has failed to bring about a solution to the political crisis in the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, the protesters are vowing to continue their mobilization until all of their rights and demands are attained. The demonstrators are demanding the release of political prisoners, most notably the dying activist Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, who has been on a hunger strike for more than two months. Fourteen international organizations called on the U.S. President Barack Obama to mount pressure on the Bahraini regime to release Al Khawaja. The group said that Al Khawaja is facing death, adding that he was subjected to torture and mistreatment that require head and face surgeries. International human rights organizations and Bahrain's Commission of Inquiry said that all trials are being held before military courts in violation of international standards and Bahraini penal codes. The rights group said that the court's ruling against Al Khawaja and other activists is a blatant violation of their rights to freedom of expression and the freedom to hold public gatherings and assemblies under the provisions of international law. Meanwhile, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney said that Washington is deeply concerned about the situation in Bahrain and urged both sides to condemn all forms of violence. Carney condemned what he described as violence against police and government institutions on one side and the use of excessive force and indiscriminate use of tear gas against protesters on the other. He also urged Bahraini rulers to double their efforts to implement the recommendations of Bahrain's Commission of Inquiry. In addition, he renewed calls for the government and the opposition to engage in a genuine dialogue leading to meaningful reforms. Furthermore, Carney urged Bahrain to consider urgently all available options to resolve Al Khawaja's case. Meanwhile, U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain, Thomas Krajewski, met with Bahraini Prime Minister Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa. Krajewski condemned what he described as the targeting of police officers while ignoring the regime's crackdown. Al Khalifa said his government will continue to counter what he described as acts of chaos and terror aimed at disrupting security and stability in the country. Despite preparatory measures taken by Bahrain to host the Formula One race, it's highly expected that the event will be canceled. This news comes after Bahraini activists called for three days of rage during the April 20th through 22nd race. People in northern Afghanistan have held an anti-American demonstration to protest fresh civilian deaths at the hands of U.S.-led forces. The protesters say U.S.-led forces have killed a teacher at his home and arrested three members of his family during a night raid in Farya province. They shouted anti-American slogans, demanding the perpetrators stand trial. The demonstration turned violence after police prevented the protesters from entering the governor's office. Two people were killed and 20 others wounded. The incident follows the killing of another civilian by U.S.-led troops in the southern Kandahar province. The police chief of uh, Kandahar province is saying that this Afghan man was on the way to his home along with his daughter when he came under fire by the American forces. The latest night raid comes just a few days after Washington and Kabul signed a deal that hands over nighttime operations to Afghan soldiers. U.S.-led forces claim they target militants during the raids, but on the ground, civilians are falling victim. Last month, U.S. soldiers shot nearly 18 Afghan civilians dead in Kandahar province. The massacre set off nationwide protests by Afghans already outraged by the U.S.-led forces burning of the Holy Quran. The latest incidents have fueled the anti-American sentiment in Afghanistan to an all-time high. 
Well, we're joined again by, of course, Bonifaz Horsheed uh, to tell us more about this. Well, Faiz, tell us more about this incident. And, of course, this comes just a few days after Washington and Kampul signed that strategic uh, uh, deal in terms of the night raids. And tell us, if you can, what is the responsibility that uh, the U.S. and its so soldiers have in the nighttime raids? Well, this latest raid has been carried out in Maimana city of Faryab in northern Afghanistan. Both Afghan and American forces were involved in this nighttime raid, and they raided on a house of a man who was teaching uh, Islamic lessons to people there. He was, in fact, a teacher of a, a religious madrasa there, and he has been killed in this raid. Two of his brothers, uh, as well as his cousin, have been detained by the American forces during this nighttime raid in his death has uh, uh, prompted people in Faria province today to take to the streets and protest against the, the presence of American forces. People there were very angry and they were chanting anti-US slogans. They were, they were calling for an immediate withdrawal of all American forces from Afghanistan. But the protesters were also chanting anti-Afghan government uh, uh, slogans. And uh, they, the protesters were ch marching towards the compound of the governor of Faria province when the anti-riot police came and they intervened. And the scuffles broke out between the protesters and the police. So far, we understand that three of these protesters have been killed in the clashes, and uh, over 20 others have been seriously injured. The situation is now under the control of the Afghan police officers, but yes, this latest civilian that in Faryab has greatly overshadowed the recent agreement that has been signed between the Afghan government and American forces. Mali's new leader has threatened to wage an all-out war on separatists controlling the north of the country. I call on all our rebel brothers and sisters to work with us, to strengthen this nation rather than divide it. I demand they stop the pillaging and rapes and leave the cities they have occupied peacefully. I insist, and I am demanding firmly, we will not hesitate to fight a total war to restore our territorial integrity. The Ankunda Traore was sworn into office as interim president in the capital of Bamako on Thursday, ending a brief period of military rule. The junta had justified toppling former president Amado Toumani Touré on grounds that the government was not effective in resisting the separatists. But following the coup, rebels vastly strengthened their position and captured key towns in the country's north. The junta handed power over to the country's former parliament speaker as part of a deal brokered by ECOWAS. The West African bloc is ready to send some 3,000 troops to assist Traore in reclaiming northern Mali. South Sudanese President Salva Kiir Mayer Dit refused to withdraw his forces from the oil-rich region Heglish and threatened to take over Abiyé if the Sudanese forces do not retreat from the area. Juba said Sudanese army warplanes raided Bentiyu, capital city of the border state of Unity, amid continuous tension between the two countries. For its part, Sudan announced it will mobilize its forces to recover the Heglish region. The UN Security Council called on Sudan and South Sudan on to halt the border battles and return to negotiations in order to avoid further deterioration of the situation by the border. The development of the Sudanese and South Sudanese scene transferred from the battleground to the parliament. Salva Kiir Mayer Deet spoke at the South Sudan National Legislative Assembly, criticizing the international calls demanding his troops' withdrawal from Heglij. Kiir responded to the call otherwise. The UN Secretary General called me saying he orders me to pull my forces out of Heglij. I said to him I am not subordinate to his command, and this time I will not order our forces to withdraw. It seems the disputes are not limited to Heglij. Kier sent other signals threatening to retake the disputed Abiyé region by force if the Sudanese army does not retreat from it. Al-Bashir is the one who sent his forces to Abiyé. I have informed the UN Secretary General that Al-Bashir must withdraw his forces from there. Otherwise, I will send troops to retake the region by force. The streets of South Sudan appeared optimistic over the possibility of retaking what they called southern territories occupied by Sudan. This stance mobilizes both sides to enter a new phase, which may lead to severe consequences in both countries.
Hegelish. The People's Army will retake Hegelish. All the southern land will be liberated, God willing. All southern territories will be retaken. In reality, both countries are suffering internal crises. An external war will help divert attention from their internal trouble. Today it is Heglish, tomorrow it may be Abiyé. A state of mobilization is dominating the leadership of both countries. The reality indicates that an extended crisis will continue. It seems that the calls for peace will fall on deaf ears as the situation is on the brink of a war. Adel Faris, Al Jazeera, Juba, South Sudan. In his response to the South Sudan People's Liberation Army's taking over Heglish, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir said the Sudanese army is capable of resolving any aggression on his country. It is obvious that our brothers in South Sudan are not considering the interests of Sudan or the interests of South Sudan. There will be absolutely no benefit for either country to continue the war. On the contrary, it will only inflict losses on both sides. They have chosen the path of war, implementing agendas dictated by foreign parties who supported them during the civil war. We affirm that we will resolve any aggression on Sudan, God willing. An administrative court has decided to suspend its hearing on the lawsuit against Egyptian presidential candidate Khairat al shatir and transferred the case to another department. In addition, the court ordered the Egyptian Interior Ministry to issue a certificate to show that candidate Hazem Abu Ismail's mother has never held another nationality other than her Egyptian nationality, opening the door for him to re-enter the presidential race. Meanwhile, the case of Ayman Noor's candidacy is once again sparking a judicial debate. This comes after Noor announced that he will resume his presidential campaign, ignoring the Egyptian judicial decision. From Cairo, our reporter Taufik Ahmed. After a long wait and a controversy among Egyptian social, political and judicial circles, an overwhelming joy has overtaken the supporters of Hazem Abu Ismail after the administrative court ordered the interior ministry to provide the Islamist presidential candidate proof that his mother was not a dual citizen. Sheikh Hazem Abu Ismail's stance is clear, and this is evidence of the Council of State's justice. The ruling was received by lawyers with different interpretations. Some see it as a return of Abu Ismail to the presidential race. Other oppose that. However, the final decision lies in the hands of the Presidential Elections Committee. From a judicial perspective, the ruling doesn't change anything regarding the citizenship issue. Also, it doesn't create a new judicial interpretation for Sheikh Saleh Abu Ismail. Why? Because Sheikh Saleh Abu Ismail does not have evidence to prove that his mother is not an American citizen. There is evidence from the American Foreign Ministry, which indicates that Sheikh Saleh Abu Ismail's mother was was a registered voter and voted in the last elections as an American citizen. In the midst of the presidential heat, Ayman Noor enters again, saying that running for that office does not require enrollment in the voters list, ignoring the decision depriving him of running for office. He will be excluded from the presidential elections race because he is not eligible to run. In order to reclaim his political rights, he must meet certain legal conditions, most notably the rehabilitation period, which is set at six years after release. Second, the pardon issued from the Supreme Council for the Armed Forces does not qualify him to run in the presidential race. Another controversy ensued over al shatters candidacy after the court panel decided to withdraw from the case. The Presidential Electoral Committee said it has completed reviewing three complaints against ten candidates, saying it will soon make a decision and disqualify anyone found ineligible. A political debate, a legal battle, and popular panic are dominating the scene in a country that is seeking to restore political, security, and economic stability through the building of government institutions in post-revolution Egypt. Meanwhile, competition for the presidential office is heating up, especially in light of the recent political twists. Taufik Ahmed, Dubai TV, Cairo.
to 1,000 pro-Palestinian foreign activists set to land in the country on Sunday, Police Commissioner Yochanan Danino today ordered his forces to do everything in their power to ensure that Ben Gurion Airport continues operating normally. More in this report from IBA's Aaron Viner. Uh, Anti-Israel activists are making last-minute preparations ahead of plans to fly into Ben Gurion International Airport this coming Sunday. One group gathered at the Resistance Bookstore in Paris, where they declared their intentions to join some 1,200 others in the third annual so-called Flightilla. The shop owner and coordinator for the French activists said that the participants include children and elderly people who are neither launching a provocation nor posing a threat to security. Is it a provocation to say, I want to visit my Palestinian friends, I want to go there, I want to see how they live, I want to share one week with, with them, I want to build a school to show my solidarity? If this is a provocation, then what is not a provocation? The group is hoping that French authorities will not respond to Israel's request to prevent them from boarding flights en route to Israel, as happened during similar attempts last year. They know, they know that we are not dangerous people. We could buy tickets without hiding, and the, the Welcome to Palestine uh, initiative is uh, transparent, it's quite clear, it's on website, it's been on websites for months, and uh, I, I, I don't see why we would be prevented to board, really. Last summer, those who managed to evade security and succeeded in arriving at Ben Gurion were arrested and deported. Hoping for a similar outcome this time around, Israel's Ministry of the Interior has already sent their European counterparts lists of suspected participants. Undercover Israeli security officials will staff passport control counters abroad, while hundreds of other police and special forces will take positions throughout Israel's arrival hall to block the entry of any activists who manage to evade the security cordons in an effort to deal with the protesters as quickly and quietly as possible without furthering the activists' bid to arouse sympathy or perceived victory in the public eye. Meanwhile, another pro-Palestinian gathering is already underway as the Belin Conference opened in the Palestinian village that has become a symbol of anti-Israel protest. Palestinians and their sympathizers say that their goal is to promote nonviolent resistance against Israel's occupation of the West Bank. Those who addressed the conference were focused on vilifying Israel. Speaking at the opening session, Palestinian Prime Minister Salam Fayyad said that his people refused to accept the existence of Israel's security barrier and Jewish settlements and that all Israeli actions are against the Palestinians' aspiration for freedom. The goal is to tear down this wall tear down this wall everywhere in Palestine. The protest against the Israeli occupation of Palestine and the protest against uh, the oppression of the Palestinian people and the support the Palestinian people for their rights to have a sovereign state, Palestinian state. The week-long conference has so far proceeded peacefully, a scenario that security forces are very much hoping will be repeated at Israel's international airport on April 15th. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. The Central Committee to Compensate Iraq's Victims of Terror and Military Mistakes announced that the total amount of funds appropriated by the Ministry of Finance during last month stands at nearly 2.5 billion Iraqi dinars, directly payable to affected citizens across the provinces. A source in the committee said the Iraqi Council of Ministers appropriated 300 billion dinars from this year's federal budget for the supervising committee and its branches in the provinces. Two laws, number 10 and number 17, were issued during the reign of Iraq's civil governor, Paul Bremer, aimed at compensating victims of terrorist operations and military mistakes after June 1st of 2004. However, due to loopholes in these two laws, another law, number 20, was issued in 2009 annulling the two previous laws and offering a wider range of benefits. According to the 2009 law, citizens who have been affected by terrorism or military mistakes after February 2nd of 2003 are eligible for compensation. This law aims to compensate anyone targeted after March 20, 2003, including martyrs, wounded, displaced, unemployed, and for those who dropped out of school due to terrorism. So it covers the martyrs injured or missing during this period of time.
أرض العراق خلال هذه الفترة. Law No. 20, which began its implementation in 2011, includes 20 provisions. The law was passed to facilitate the compensation procedures with specific stipulations. On the basis of the law, an amount of 73 billion Iraqi dinars were allocated for the compensations. This law offers a wider range of privileges. The allocation of funds will be prioritized as follows, human loss, property loss, retirement pension, and loss of land. In fact, though this law was issued in 2009, it had not been enforced until 2011. In order to facilitate the process of dispersing the funds to the eligible candidates, the Prime Minister's advisory office instructed the citizens to go to their local jurisdictional councils, where the incidents occurred, instead of heading to irrelevant institutions and organizations. From Baghdad, Zaid al Mustaf, al Iraqiya. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows, and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.